Hello and welcome to the Women's Weekly Bible Challenge. I'm Lisa Ann Spencer. Thank you for joining me today. This is part three of our series called When Jesus Speaks to Women. All right, so I keep saying we're going to finish Matthew, but today we actually are going to finish um, our study in Matthew, When Jesus Speaks to Women and then we'll move into Mark next week. I know I asked you last week to spend some time reading Mark, but if you've done that, what you've noticed is most of the occurrences of Jesus speaking to women in Mark have already been covered in Matthew, not all. So when we do get to Mark next week, it's going to be really quick, and we're actually going to jump right into Luke. Okay, so hope you'll stay tuned for that. All right, so let's jump right into our study. Um, Jesus speaks to James and John's mother. So open up your Bible to Matthew chapter 20. And by the way, I do hope that you have a journal with you today because I'm going to be popping up a lot of references, things that I just do not have time to cover. I've been trying to make these videos a little bit shorter than 30 minutes. I know that 30 minutes is a bit intimidating to most busy wives and mothers. So that means you're going to have to do a little extra work on your own in writing these things down and uh, studying them for yourself. All right, so I'm just going to read Matthew, and I'm not there yet, 20. And I'm going to begin in verse 20 and read down through 28. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? She said unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, sit the one on thy right hand and the other on the left in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what ye ask. Are ye able to drink the cup, drink of the cup that I shall drink of, and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They say unto him, We are able. And he said unto them, Ye shall drink indeed of my cup, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my father. And when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. But Jesus called them unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. All right, there's a parallel passage in Mark. I want you to maybe go ahead and flip over there. We're not going to read it for sake of time, but Mark 10, and you might want to mark this in your Bible or at least write it down in your journal. Mark chapter 10, and this passage begins in verse 35 and goes down to verse 41. So if you have another bookmark or slip of paper, you might stick it right there because we may flip to some of the comparisons. All right, but it's the same, um, same passage except there's something missing, which you probably noticed. Okay, so in this Matthew passage, we see the mother of Zebedee's children. So there are lots of Bible verses that indicate to us who are the sons of Zebedee. And I'll pop two of those up here for you to write down, Matthew 4, 21 and Mark 1, 19. We know from those passages and many others that the sons of Zebedee are James and John, two of the very prominent 12 apostles. Okay, so a question that arises in my mind is, what brought this request on? What caused them to even dare to come up to Jesus and ask 
this question about be, having these places of honor in his kingdom. Well, there are three things. You might want to jot these three things down, and we will spend a little bit of time looking at these. Number one is the Mount of Transfiguration. Okay, that had just occurred in Matthew 17. We're going to go look at that. Um, in fact, let's just go ahead. No, I want to list all three things first. Number one, the Mount of Transfiguration. Number two, the promise to the 12 apostles that they would sit on 12 thrones judging Israel. We're going to turn to that and see that. And then number three is the fact that they're nearing Jerusalem and they're nearing the triumphal entry of Jesus. All right, so turn to Matthew 17, just a few pages back, 17.1. And here it is where you see... Um, Jesus, it says, After six days Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up to an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. So we won't read that whole passage, but you know that those three men were selected out of the twelve to accompany Jesus up on that mountain with him to see him transfigured and to see Moses and Elijah and to hear the voice of God. That was a really big deal. All right, so flip on over to Matthew 19. Matthew 19 and verse 28. And Jesus said unto them, and he's speaking to his twelve apostles, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. They knew that they had a high and exalted position. All twelve of them did. Okay, so that's the second reason. And then the third is that they are nearing Jerusalem and the triumphal entry of Jesus. So when it says, and let's look maybe at Matthew 20, verse 17. Yes. And Jesus going up to Jerusalem took the twelve disciples apart in the way. Okay, so he speaks to them. So... Um, his going up, his ascension to the city. They always say ascending or going up because Jerusalem is a city on a hill and they literally did have to go up hill. But it is not strictly speaking about the fact that they had to walk up hill. The word ascension in the Bible has to do with ascending to the throne to rule. A king would ascend to his throne. Okay, so they were all in expectation uh, that this is it. We've been preaching the, about this kingdom for three years, and Jesus is about to make this glorious entry. All you have to do is go up one chapter to um, Matthew 21, and it says, When they drew nigh unto Jerusalem. So they're this is the beginning of that chapter on Jesus coming into the city. They lay down the palm branches and everybody says, Hosanna uh, to the son of David. All right. So all these followers are in expectation of Jesus receiving the kingdom and giving them the 12 thrones. All right. I established this context because context is critical. You should never just try to understand a passage, even one so simple as the mother of James and John coming and asking Jesus this request. Can my sons sit on your right hand and on your left? All right. Today, we know that Jesus's followers failed to understand all the Old Testament prophecies and even the words out of Jesus' own mouth about him having to suffer before he could receive the kingdom. He told them that many, many times. And every time it says it, it says they didn't understand it. This was hid from them. Let me pop up a couple of references for you. Matthew 20, 17 through 19, and Mark 10, 32 through 34. Those two references are the passages right before um, this 
incident that we're studying right now and he tells them I have to suffer I have to be killed and then I'll rise again the third day so on my blog if you'll check it out I have quite a list of um, Bible references in Matthew and Mark where Jesus several times told them that he would die and it says that they did not understand it let's look at one um, Real quick, let's see if this one, Mark 9, yeah, flip over to Mark, and let's look at verse, chapter 9, verse 31, 32, nope, that's not it. Okay, I've got it written down somewhere else. Let's look at Luke 18, let's see if that's it. There's one, there's several, but there's one that just plainly says, um, this saying was hid from them. They did not understand it. Um, Luke 18, 34. Um, he just finishes telling them. He foretells his death in verses 31, 32, and 33. And it says, And they understood none of these things, and the saying was hid from them, neither knew they the things which were spoken. They did not understand Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. All right, so a question should pop up in your mind. This gospel that Jesus died and he was buried and he rose again the third day, that's in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verses 1 through 4. Um, that is our gospel today for the dispensation of grace. It's how we're saved. There's no other way. But the twelve apostles did not even understand this, and they had been preaching the gospel for three years. So what gospel had they been preaching? Well, the Bible tells us very clearly what they were preaching because it tells us the gospel of the kingdom the good news of the kingdom. There's lots of different gospels in your Bible. If you'll just do a word search on the word gospel, you can see for yourself that there's many different gospels in your Bible. But look at Matthew 4, 23, write that one down, where it says they're preaching the gospel of the kingdom. So what did the gospel of the kingdom involve? It didn't involve the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus because they didn't know that. It involved repenting and turning back to the law of Moses. The twelve apostles and Jesus taught you need to keep the law of Moses. See Matthew 3, 2 and then Matthew 23, 3 to confirm that for yourself. The kingdom invo involved being water baptized. That was needful for the nation of Israel so that they could be cleansed from their sin. Mark 1, 4 and it would qualify them to be a kingdom of priests, as was written in their law in Exodus 19.6. Remember, that law was given to the nation of Israel. All right, this preaching of the gospel involved the kingdom is at hand. It's very near. It is soon to be set up on the earth, Matthew 6.10. The Messiah's throne would be headquartered at Jerusalem, Jeremiah 3, 17. And Israel was always promised that they would be the head, the head of all nations, the head of the world, and not the tail, Deuteronomy 28, 13. So this is the context of the kingdom in which the mother of James and John has come to Jesus and asked this question, and Jesus speaks to her and says, What wilt thou? So again, if you're not at Matthew um, 20, please turn back there, and you can see again, if you look closely at verse 21, this is what she says to him, or what he says unto her, What wilt thou? All right, what is your desire? What do you desire, ma'am? All right, so um, Jesus does not answer her, um, and I'll tell you why I think that is, but I want to point out a couple of things. The reason uh, that I know that he is not speaking to her is because when he answers, he says, ye know not what ye ask. 
period. All right, I've showed you before in a previous Bible study that in your King James Bible, thee and thou are singular, ye and you are plural. It's a good thing to note when you're reading your Bible, it will help you. So he says, what wilt thou? That's singular. Um, mother of Zebedee's children, you. What do you want? See, we use you as singular, but the Bible uses it as plural. Thou is singular, so it's very important. That's why your King James Bible is probably, it's the only one that is going to make this distinction. All right, Jesus said, ye know not what ye ask. Ye is plural. He does, he's not addressing her. He's addressing the sons. How do we know that? The reason we know it is because in the passage in Mark, the parallel passage, the mother is never even mentioned. It just, it says the sons request it. The mom is not even involved in it. And we know that she is because of Matthew, but he ignores her because he knows that those men have put her up to asking the question. And this makes me wonder about you know, possibly how old are they? Uh, they must be um, quite young men under 19 as the Bible describes Deuteronomy 139 compared with Numbers 14, 26 through 39 because it's really hard for me to imagine two grown men putting their mother up to making this request. So I think the boys were quite young. Okay, so also if you'll notice in this Matthew passage in verse 24, when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. The Mark passage says they were much displeased with the two brethren. They're not mad at his mom for asking this question. They're mad at the brothers because they know in reality that James and John are the source of this question. All right, and another thing is at the Mount of Transfiguration, and if you want to pop back to Matthew 17 and look at verse 9, um, and as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, Peter, James, and John, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. So perhaps they obeyed and told no man, but what do you want to bet that they told their mama? Um, that's speculation on my part, but they could have been obedient to Jesus and done it, you know, and told their mom anyway. So if you consider um, all these things together, um, the Mount of Transfiguration, the promises, the promise of sitting on 12 thrones, the fact that they're entering Jerusalem and the triumphal ent entry is at hand, this really is a perfectly natural question. Um, the 10 were probably mad because they didn't get there first to be able to make that request. Um, it's obvious from all of Scripture, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that Peter, James, and John had exalted positions with Jesus. And we'll see that again in next week's study. Um, but their mistake was they failed to understand the price that had to be paid by them and by Jesus before that kingdom could be received. They demonstrated a real cowardliness by having their mother make the request for them. And then they demonstrated false bravery when they said, oh yes, we can drink this cup that you have to be baptized with. And so the thing that we can learn from this passage is that what James and John had done is they had picked the parts of Scripture um, that they liked. They knew those. They were well aware of those, and they believed it, and that's admirable. But they failed to see other parts of Scripture that had they known, they would not have made such a request. We also need to um, take the parts of the Bible that are directed to us and study those and be obedient to the thing that Jesus has to say to us. Okay, we need to rightly divide the word of truth. All right, we're going to move on to the second and the last um, 
occurrence of Jesus speaking to women in the book of Matthew, and that's going to be in Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. The passage is verses 1 to 10, but I'm not going to take the time to read all that for sake of time. I just want us to look at 9 and 10. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. All right, so here we have Jesus speaking to a group of women. All hail. The Webster's 1828 Dictionary gives this definition. That means to call a person at a distance to arrest his attention. Okay, so that's what they first heard out of Jesus' mouth. And then he said, go tell my brethren to meet me in Galilee. All right, he had already instructed them, but he was sending the women to make that known. All right, so this event happens between the wee hours of Saturday after midnight and the early morning hours of Sunday in the dark before the sun rises and then even after the sun rises, darkness and light. This event is covered in each of the four Gospels. Many books have been written about the details of this event, and some of those even in an attempt to disprove the Bible because the events seem to contradict one another. It would take me several Bible studies to entirely cover the details of these events, all of which are true, but that study is outside my sphere as a woman teacher. But I do encourage you, study these events in detail very carefully, knowing that the Holy Spirit inspired each of these men to remember the details that he chose to reveal to each writer. Please see John 14, verse 26. We'll do well to remember that all men are liars, but God cannot lie. All right, in this very passage of Matthew 28, the only two women are mentioned, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, okay? And she's referred to in other Gospels. So... When we see Jesus speaking to just these two women, or so it seems from this passage, we understand from the other Gospels that there were many other women. They are mentioned by name that came to the sepulcher. The thing about it is they're coming and going. Some of the apostles are coming and going. There's a lot of going back and forth. So do not try to blend the events together but try to write them down and study them in detail. All right, so we know he was speaking actually to a group of women. All right, so the remarkable thing to me about this passage is that Jesus, after his resurrection, he appeared and spoke first unto women. In so many religions of the world, there's a false um, teaching regarding women. Either they're stomped on and put down so low and disregarded, or they're held up on a pedestal and worshipped in the form of a goddess, both which are wrong. But in Christianity, in the Bible, we discover the true value and the proper honor that God has given to women. And I say amen, and I am thankful for it. I'm ending here. Next week, as I said, we're going to get to Mark, but it's going to only take us brief, and we'll jump right into Luke. So your challenge this week is to go ahead and read through Luke if you have time. I hope that you'll join me as we continue our study when Jesus speaks to women.